Welcome to the Exarbon Insurance Podcast. I'm J.R. Rivera, CEO and co-founder of Exarbon Insurance. This is a relaunch or revamp of the podcast aiming to target industry leaders in real estate, mortgage, insurance, investments, and pretty much anyone kicking ass in their field. I want to talk to motivated individuals, people getting after and making it happen, innovating and working their tail off to succeed. So, and succeed, whatever that means to those individuals themselves. So with that being said, Jose Pena, thank you so much for joining me here at the Exarbon Insurance Podcast, Insur- Exarban Insurance Podcast, messing up already. <laughs> Thanks for being here, man. Thank you, man. Thank you. I apologize. Uh, I apologize. I thank you for setting the bar a little bit lower for me, you know, with the, <laughs> with the start. But with the intro? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it been should a minute. be fun. It's been a minute, man. I wanted to kind of start off with a fresh, different approach you know, getting you out here and really having more of a, a laid back conversation. You know, I've known you for a long, long time yeah. since we were kids, since we were plebes back in <laughs> West Point, Nebraska. Um, and but recently we kind of gotten back connected over the last few years, you getting into the investment world. And, you know, now I know that you are the, the owner, CEO, founder of Nice Casas LLC, Builder and LLC, and now Light Switch Homes LLC. So it's exciting having you here so that we can have a little bit of conversation how things kind of came to be yeah. and who Jose Peña is. So tell us a little bit about your childhood and growing up, What got, how you get into the, this career. So uh, childhood, uh, my wife always uh, makes fun of me because when people ask me, where are you from? I actually never like know exactly what to say. Because mm. it's three different uh, places at this point, right? Yeah. I was born in California. I was raised in Sinaloa till I was 12. I finished elementary over there. And at that point, uh, pretty much all my uh, my dad, my my aunts, everybody was here in Nebraska at that point, right? Yeah. So then they decided, hey, you know what? It's time for you guys to join us. So me and my grandma came over to, to Nebraska to a little small town, Beamer, Nebraska, with like yeah. 800 population and i'm pretty sure they counted some cows in there <laughs> yeah it's uh, I, re- I lived there for a little bit too for like six months yeah 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 i mean it was it was definitely definitely a change right but it was a it was a good change it was a good change i i now see it uh, i still have in my mind like the picture of me looking back on the little truck that we were driving uh out of palmitas sinaloa and seeing my friends just standing back, right, and just waving goodbye, not knowing when I was going to come back, right? Yeah. Um, the good thing is that um, I had citizenship, so I knew there was going to be a, a, a time of me going back. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to start off, uh, I mean, I was, I was a baby when my dad made the decision to take me down to Mexico uh, to Culiacán uh, at that point, mm-hmm. which is uh, the capital city of, of Sinaloa. And my mom passed away when I was just a, a baby. You know, mm-hmm. I was I was months old. Uh, she she passed away in in Mexico, and I was in between families with my grandma from my mom's side, and then my grandma from my dad's side. But they, my dad made the you could say executive decision to yeah. to go with my with my grandma from from his side, right? Yeah. His mom, which I call mom, because I mean I met her when I was freaking like seven eight months old. Yeah. So, I mean, we we lived in Culiacán for, shoot, I want to say seven years. Yeah. Uh, at that point, those seven years, everybody migrated, uh, immigrated to to California. Mm-hmm. Uh, dad, aunts, uh, California and Nebraska, it was a mix. Mm-hmm. And since everybody was over here, my we were renting in Culiacán. My grandma, mom made a decision to move to the little town of Palmitas. Mm-hmm. Uh, which she had a home there. Sure. Um, she had a home there. So she moved to, to Culiacán to uh, basically raise my aunts, um, not raise my aunts, but uh, help them out through their college years over mm-hmm. there uh, or school or work. And I lived in, in Palmitas for about four years, and it was fun, man. It was a, it was a fun childhood. Yeah. Uh, I, I, did, I wouldn't say I got to do any adult stuff because I was 12 when, sure. when I came to the U.S., yeah. but uh, I've done plenty of that afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Palmitas, I mean, that's definitely, you, were, you said you were 12. So at age 12, what kind of culture shock was that going oh. back to Nebraska? Or did you stop at California? Or did you go to California? Or just straight to Nebraska? Straight to Nebraska. No. Well, I guess it had to be a stop because freaking Omaha doesn't have a big airport. But <laughs> Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, yeah. It was straight to it was straight to Beamer, Nebraska. And uh, they had a, such a small school that after a year, they closed that school down. Not yeah. enough students, right? Right. 
uh, I guess uh, people weren't really doing their job. The population wasn't growing. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. So they, they. I see what you did there. It yeah. took me a second. <laughs> <laughs> they joined schools uh, with West Point, and then that's where I met my wife, Lucy. Mm -hmm. Mm. Lucy, but uh, yeah, uh, she had a very similar story like me. You know, she came when she was 12 also. We both landed here at the age of 12, 2001. I mean, uh, yeah, it was a, it was definitely a, a culture shock uh, for from my perspective. Literally, me and two cousin, three cousins were the only Hispanics in that school. Yeah. Right. And which was had its pros and cons because the pros were we're getting a lot of attention from the from the teachers. Mm -hmm. So it was just me, my three cousins getting taught by two teachers you know but i mean a lot of attention you only had 800 people in one school so <laughs> yeah you already yeah. had quite a bit of attention I know. but you even had more a right. little more specialized and focused uh, attention there um and then you ended up going to moving to west point did you uh, later on or did you still live in beamer later on it took us about i drove the bus i didn't i, I didn't drive the bus <laughs> that was, that's illegal don't do it here um <laughs> I took the bus from Beamer to West Point for about a year, I'd say, and then we moved over to West Point. Uh, I I moved with my aunt and my my mom and yeah. and her family, and from there we uh, we finished high school. And at that point, you know, it took me about three years to convince Lucy that this was a good idea. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we went to Wayne State College. Um, for about a year and a half and then transition over to to you and you guys went to school together out there too yeah nice, nice yeah nice. yeah yeah that's awesome man and how, how do you end up getting into the career that you picked originally and how how was that like what was your intent during that time what was your, th your train or thought process i guess you would say uh, there wasn't a lot behind it man I, I wouldn't say it was very specific or anything like that but coming to the u.s from a small town, never seen a computer before, mm -hmm. never, right? Uh, we didn't have a car over there either. So mm -hmm. it, it was like, uh, we're riding the bus uh, and seeing a computer, I thought like, what is that, right? And I, st I saw them everywhere here, everywhere in the schools and all that. And so I'm like, I, I became super interested in its capabilities mm -hmm. and what it could do, right? Yeah. And I was kind of like the, uh, I guess, dedicated dj for the family so i was like burning cds oh, yeah. left and right you know doing <laughs> the lime wire and all this <laughs> all that good Napster. stuff that's awesome man so you kind of got i guess you found a fascination in technology yeah. and uh jump right in with because I, I remember that i guess it was like an assignment for every kid in every household as soon as a a, a parent wanted to get Anything done that involved technology, the kids had to kind of steer the wheel there at that point, um, which I'm guessing it's part of the just our generation. Yeah. You have to be that, that kind of person. But um, that's awesome. So you found an attraction right into technology from the get go. Yeah. Um, and you decided to go into software engineering. Yeah. Uh, computer science is the, is the field. I did that for a year and a half over there in Wayne State. But Wayne didn't have a big program in regards to computers. And yeah. we know that Omaha has the Peter Kiewit, you know, Institute over here. Yeah. So that's like hardcore computer stuff. And thankfully, like uh, my wife, Lucy, she helped me do some essays and we both got the Susan Buffett scholarship. Oh, yeah. And yeah. at that point, which was freaking awesome because uh, now they don't offer it to like sophomores in college. They only offer it to incoming freshmen. Right. Mm. So we were kind of like that last uh i guess wave wave people, of yeah. uh, students that got it once they were in college so that that helped That's me out a lot because uh the stress uh, like my family I, I think your your mom and dad bought some tacos mm -hmm. from us because we were selling tacos during my first semester to like help with with you know paying college yeah. and stuff like that uh so that just dropped off the weight of uh from my shoulders and my family's shoulders yeah. to pay for that right so i'm like okay now i could go at this full throttle without worrying about other stuff, right? We uh, had FAFSA, the Susan Buffett, and then another. Uh, I got another full right mm -hmm. apart from that, which was, I guess, I, at that point, I was getting paid to go to college. Which hey, was you're a little brainiac. I didn't crazy. know you were that, that <laughs> smart, man. God dang, that's awesome. That's, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people end up finding difficulty getting into the field that they want to or getting into something interesting for them. 
it's, it's it's hard even getting into school in general, but let mm-hmm. alone getting into a degree that they really like and they want to pursue. And you know those kinds of those those bumps on the road. One of the biggest bumps on the road is money. Right. I mean, God dang, that's a break it or make it kind of deal. If you don't have that financial support from somewhere, in your case, you either had to go sell tacos and you know get into a bunch of debt or. <laughs> Make sure that you did your your best at school and and uh, and then do your due diligence with the with right. the with the scholarship. So that's that's awesome. And I I know that my brother, my middle brother, he ended up doing the same um, or got into the same scholarship. I'm not sure on the whole process, but I wasn't as smart as you guys. But it was a, <laughs> it was fun to see you guys get after it and 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 you guys uh, you and Lucy get out to you know. I, I wasn't sure if you had gone to Wayne State or if it was straight to UNO, but I knew that you were rocking it out there in school. Mm-hmm. Um, at least my brother would tell me all the time that you guys were connecting and you know going to the same school. I think it was a PKI with you. Yeah, I, I think I saw him once or twice there. Yeah. He freaking like you know child face there, yeah. just roaming around the halls. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was, yeah. that's awesome. But well, and, and you decided to go into that field. Uh, did you did you have any like thoughts about potentially getting into something different you know what and the funny thing i i did switch a little bit Mm -hmm. so i went into computer science i mean it was freaking hard man i mean it it was it was super tough math classes were super tough i think i took like seven or eight math classes it was it was a lot right so i asked my advisor i'm like hey i want to i want to go out there i want to start making money now what can i do to graduate sooner rather than um because Math classes, you know, you can't have a hard schedule with like two math classes on the same semester. That that kill you. Yeah. Or tough. I'd be like you at this point without yeah, without hair. <laughs> without hair, you know. Yep. It's so it's all stress. Yeah, it's all stress. It's all stress, right? So I'm like, no, stop that. Um, I decided to move over to management information systems. Oh. Which gotcha. technically you could also become a software engineer by uh, graduating with a degree like that. But it's less math classes and yeah. it's a little bit more business classes, yeah. which I like business. Uh, yeah. And I'm like, you know what, Let, let's do that. So I, I instead of taking like three super hard classes, I just took one and I was able to graduate and get the same job title yeah. as you would with a computer science. Nice. And that you made that switch, I'm guessing, as, as you were moving into UNO. No, I actually did it on like my junior year because they're very, they're very, very, very similar. Mm. Very similar, uh, I guess, uh, work. uh, The same classes pretty much. It's just one requires more math and the other one requires a little bit more business. So micro, macroeconomics, all that, all all that good stuff, accounting, which has helped me with QuickBooks. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I remember MIS. I, I actually took several classes with them going through the the actually the business degree. I took some MIS classes, so it's yeah. interesting that you say that. It's they were a very fun classes, honestly. Some of the most useful, I would say, because yeah. technology is everywhere in business. I mean, requires technology. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, that's great, man. Um, how did you decide to get into real estate investment, and why? Like, that's a big. That's the million dollar question right there, man. Yeah, yeah. How did that light bulb get triggered, right? Um, with the light switch. The hey, light switch home. See what you did there again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was working at Northrop Grumman uh, for six years, right out of college. Right, they had a little job fair, which I actually got towed during that job fair, which, you know, I, I guess it, it turned out all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was at North Grandma for six years. I was driving back and forth. I live on around 132nd and Maple here in Omaha. So that's a 30 minute drive there and 30 minute uh, drive back home, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I got into a very specific uh, program at North Grandman with a group of people that were super like professional development driven. We mm. were having kind of competitions in regards to how many books you would read, how many volunteering hours you would do, um, anything related to like giving back to the community, speaking at meetup events, uh, do, just anything that you can do to improve your professional development, sure. right? Like scrum master classes, uh, product owner classes, all related to to that stuff. So they were pushing, you know, read this book, read this book, read this book. I read a lot of books related to technology and then I started like, getting a little bit more towards the business side of the books, right? Mm -hmm. 
and I decided to read the four hour work week. Ah, yeah. That's a freaking yeah. amazing I title. Think you were one of the first people that told me about like to read that book. It was probably about a year ago. It was a great book. It is a freaking great book. Um, that kind of turned on the light bulb for me in regards to like do something else, right? Do something else. I, I wanted to do something else. Uh, I actually told my partner, Amador, that I was actually doing the mystery shopper. That's freaking crazy because yeah. I mean, I was, I was. I went out and test drove a car yeah. and I got paid like 27 bucks by submitting the survey afterwards. And I went to PF Chang's, had dinner twice, submitted the receipts, pictures. I got paid like 14 bucks and a free, wow. free dinner. Right. So I was like, what else can I do? What else can I do? And then real estate, like real estate came in. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it's something physical, tangible, something like I can, I can manipulate, like I can drive it. Right. It all depends how much I put into it. Sure. Right. Uh, and that's where it's kind of like betting on yourself at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you know what, if if it's all on me, then I can control it. Right. right. And then and that's 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 how I decided to get into it. Uh, I, Bigger Pockets podcast. Um, yeah. Once I made the decision that real estate was going to be the, the thing, Bigger Pockets podcast, I consumed like 130 episodes of that uh, at that point, which Jesus. was. Or what, like a year or what? Uh, within like a year and a half. Well, no, it was actually less than that. It was it was way less than that, like seven months because uh, I was consuming so much content. Like on a, on a yeah. daily basis, I was consuming like one podcast, right? One podcast. And then they, in the evenings, I would work, go work out. I would consume another podcast. Yeah. Uh, so I, I did a whole, a, a whole bunch of that. A whole bunch of that. And it got me to the position where I felt comfortable about it, right? Yeah. I knew the terminology. I knew the, like, what it all entailed. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the practical stuff because I didn't have any experience at that point. But I knew my way around it. it isn't it kind of addicting once you get it really no, into man. it? Then you're just like, what else can I learn? What? And, and it, there's always that hesitation of, I'm guessing, jumping in and you're just kind of, uh, there's a term for it. You, you say it every once in a while. Uh, analysis paralysis. Analysis paralysis. So yeah. You kind of overthink and overthink, and you think, well, maybe I can learn a little bit more. Maybe you know, maybe next month might be the right. And that's how you end up, you know, kind of. But regardless, all that knowledge, it's not gone to waste. You were putting it right into the database, right into your right. your brain housing group, how we call it in the Marine Corps. <laughs> so brain housing that's group. that's it's you're adding more tools to your to your arsenal. So tour tool belt yeah so um that's that's great when you were doing all those podcasts uh, were you starting to get involved in some of the real estate groups or not yet or that that kind of come later i did i did and the thing is that um i went to those real estate meetup groups and i wanted to have like things lined up and lined up mm. for when i started having those conversations with investors i wanted to make sure that people knew like this guy is ready to pull the trigger and sure. stuff right so um, I had, I, we bought a house uh, earlier in 2014, I believe, mm -hmm. and we were paying a lot towards it, you know, a, a little bit extra every, every other month. Sure. And I had some, we have some, had some equity on that, have some equity on that home right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned about the HELOC, you mm -hmm. know, putting that money to work because it's basically money sitting on your yeah. house, right? So... The richest men of Babylon, you know, I, I read that book and they say, you know, put your money to work, put your money to work. That's that's what you need to be doing, making your money, make you more money. Right. So we got access to to that equity through a home equity line of credit sure. at, a, at a credit union. Uh, and that is basically I came in with knowledge and the firing power mm -hmm. to actually pull the trigger. Right. And I started having those conversations with people at the meetup. And that's how I came across the first lead. Did you see anybody or hear about anybody using HELOCs, home equity line of credits, uh, to start into this business? Or did you even ask any questions or you just decided that was my, probably a good idea? Uh, bigger pockets. Bigger pockets. Gotcha. Bigger pockets. There, There's a lot of episodes where that's how people get started. Through Makes a sense. HELOC or through like house hacking or buying your first primary home and then just That's moving scary. to the to the next one, right? Makes sense. Yeah. And well, we could talk about HELOCs all day. That's a whole nother topic. But right. uh it's it's great that you were able to find something in. Tell me about your first experience. How did that go? 
Um, first investment. First investment. Uh, it was actually, uh, and I'm very grateful uh, to the to the Miller Way guys, uh, John mm. Miller specifically. He came uh, across a property and I was speaking to him at the real estate meetup events, right? Yeah. I, I would go out to people and then kind of like, you know, tap them on the shoulder like, hey, I'm Jose. Yeah. Nice to meet you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> Who's this guy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I want to be like you type yeah. of thing, right? <laughs> so he knew that I was out there. He knew that I had the Gila. He knew that I had, you know, some basic knowledge in regards to real estate. And he's like, hey, you know what? I came across this property. Uh, it doesn't meet our numbers. It could potentially meet yours if you're willing to throw in some sweat equity at this at this thing, right? And I'm like, yeah, let's let's go take a look at it. Vámonos. You were like, let's go. Por la costera, <laughs> le dije. Uh, we went and take a, took a look at it, and it, it was a nice. Pro it's a nice property, Eighth uh, Street on Little Italy area, uh, yeah. and you know he's like, forty eight is is what they're asking for. Uh, we can't uh, at that point it, it didn't meet their buy box right mm -hmm. and i'm like shoot i'll take it you know explain what a buy box is kind of <laughs> like people have identified um i want a property to have three bedrooms two baths within this price range within this location and if it meets if it meets that criteria people go after it right mm -hmm. if it falls outside of that either they look for some creative ways or potentially you know send it to the to the next Somebody guy. Somebody else. Did yeah. that, does this meet your, did you even have a buy box at this time? I was willing to take you just anything. <laughs> I just wanted to get started. Yeah. 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 But it turned out all right, this deal. It did. It did. I'm, um, I'm not sure if you heard of the Burr method, the mm -hmm. buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat, mm -hmm. right? So we were able to do that. We were able to buy the property. Uh, I put in like 12 grand into it. Uh, and then I refinanced all my money back out, right? Yeah. So I technically owned the property for zero bucks. That's awesome, man. And it's crazy to think yeah. about it, right? And once I put that, uh, once I proved the concept, then my wife was on board. Oh, yeah, it. Yeah, it was like, yeah. okay, yeah, it works. Yeah. So, but you had your money back, and now where you're like, all right, let's go do it again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that was it. I'm like, okay. You know, kind of like uh, pull up your pants again. Yeah, and let's then go. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, let's go at it again, and let's look for an, uh, another opportunity because you get into this kind of like rhythm that like as soon as i uh we acquired that property it was go 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 you know trying to get it as quickly as possible to rent ready sure and yeah. once that dies off then you're like okay i i need to keep on moving because i was moving at another pace you know a month ago yeah yeah a little different so yeah you know and it's it's interesting you're telling me this whole jump and it sounds like it's you know it just kind of came by by chance you learned a lot you really did your homework and then all of a sudden one day it happened, but it's, I don't, I don't usually meet a lot of people that are, you know, successful at their, uh, at what they're doing and, you know, out there kicking ass and really taking names. If, you know, I don't really meet people that are doing this outside of their original field. Most people stay in their lane, go at it, do a great job and, you know, reach their idea of success or, or some degree of success mm -hmm. and are always striving to do better, but they stay in their lane. That's the unique part about certain individuals like you, that you decide you were doing, you were successful at what you were doing and right. successful to a certain extent. It wasn't probably the definition that you wanted, but you saw this opportunity somewhere else and you had that self confidence or that self belief to say, I can do this. It's controllable. And if it's controllable by me, it'll be, it'll make, I'll make it happen. Right. And you jump. So that's, that's kudos to you, man. And kudos to those individuals doing that because it takes a lot of, I feel, courage. Yeah. And it's uh, it's hard to explain to the wife, I'm sure. It's, <laughs> <laughs> you're saying you have to show proof of concept. Right, <laughs> right. Once you get that proof of concept ready, then uh, it, that alleviates a little bit of the concerns, right, on, mm -hmm. on, on both sides. Because to me, like, I was trying to prove this to myself too, you know, uh, because I, you, you read about it, you listen about it, you hear about it. Uh, you go to the meetups events and you you see people doing it. So I'm like, uh, I, I'm I'm of the mind that if I see somebody else doing it, yeah. I can do it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's, it all depends on how much work you're willing to put in, how committed sure. are you type of thing. That's awesome. I mean, you you have a fire in you and I feel like a lot of a lot of people getting after it. I mean, you have to have that if you don't. Mm -hmm. well, I was going to say, you know, maybe 90% of the people out there, they don't, you don't have that. They, they're content and content might be enough. But for so yeah. those individuals that are just looking for that, 
that level, whatever that level means to individuals. And I'll ask you a few more details, <laughs> more questions about that here in a sec. But um, I feel like that's really what makes people move. Um, so Nice Casas, you set up Nice Casas and, and uh, Build Tour. Mm -hmm. uh, why Build Tour? What is Build Tour? So Nice Casas was the first one, right? Nice Casas was uh, intended to be the, the, pro the, the LLC that holds the properties, uh, the gotcha. passive income properties, the rentals and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Build Tour came about afterwards, like a year after, no, two years afterwards, because um, I ran into a problem with the property that I was, I was fixing up in Bellevue. Mm. Uh, I got red tagged, which means that you have to stop work and you have to get, uh, I, I didn't even know about this. Like uh, at that point, like licensed individuals, like uh, electricians, plumbers, mechanical and builders, right? Mm -hmm. You have to get uh, people with those traits in order to be able to continue and flip the property. Because uh, that was- You can't just flipped. go out and do it all yourself. No, no. Okay. Uh, so they, what happened? Did they just show up and- Yep, they show up with this little red piece of paper, stamp it on your door, and then oh, they man. tell you stop work on that. And then actually your fees sometimes to pull the permits either uh, double or quadruple. <laughs> oh my gosh. Which is, I mean. Uh, did they fine you at all on top of it? Like, yeah, they did. I paid 1200 to pull permits on that house. Jesus. Yeah. So, I mean, that was a learning experience. So you, what do you yeah. just say? I'm. I'm going to go do this myself. No, 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 no. I, I, I got to that. I arrived at that point later on, like within a month mm -hmm. because I was actually looking for contractors to do the work. Right. Uh, I, I went out there, I put a Facebook post to see like, Hey, do you guys know of anybody in this area that have a, you know, a, um, like a contractor's general contractor's license, a plumber's license and a mechanical and electrician, just trying to get all the crew set up ready yeah. to finish the project right yeah. so um electricians and plumbers uh, and mechanical i was able to obtain right mm -hmm. away but a uh, general contractor i was um i was having a lot of issues like they were coming in with bids you know like triple quadruple than what i had in regards to like my budget yeah right and i'm like you know what i'm just gonna go take this test because I, I i started reading up about it and I noticed that you only had to read like a smaller portion of a book in order to obtain the license. And once, uh, well, a passing grade. Mm -hmm. And once you have a passing grade, you go to the city, get your license, get your bond, get your insurance, and then boom, you're able to pull permits. You say like it's easy, but it's <laughs> I hear that it's a <laughs> it's a tough task. And you just, I mean, you again coming back to that that self uh, self assurance or self self belief or self confidence. You needed it. You were having issues. You're like, you know what? I'm just going to go get it. Screw it. <laughs> and that's it. You know, when, when issues arrive, uh, it's kind of like, okay, I'm at this point. Yeah. What I, I'm already here. You're already there. I'm yeah. already here. What do I need to get out of there? And then, I mean, it turned out to be a blessing because yeah. now I'm able to pull permits. I, we got two houses out of the demo list recently. So, I mean, I'm, I'm able to go into the city, pull permits for that stuff and get working with that. And I'm guessing that opens up your opportunities. It does. Yeah. So it does. It gives does. you a leg up in your industry. You know, with, with everything that you've done and you, you did it all in a sense by yourself, obviously you had partnerships, you, you didn't have partnerships, you had relationships um, and a lot of networking that you were doing, but you never had a partnership until now. Light switch homes. Right. The, the light bulb ding. <laughs> you were like, yeah. how did that happen, man? How did you decide to partner up with Amador? So, uh, uh, me and my wife were on a trip re recently and I was listening to a book, right? Um, and it was nothing related to, to this specific thing, but it, it was the miracle morning mm. and this guy was accomplishing so much, right? Like he was trying to do so much within the day that he had to actually start waking up earlier. Right. Sure. But from my perspective, we got to a point and where, my time was very limited. Like I was running thin on almost everything, right? Like yeah. um, contractors, uh, property management, flips, uh, finding leads. Trying to wear all the hats. Trying to wear all the hats, right? So I started thinking, uh, like, what is it that I can do to actually speed up the process and make it even more enjoyable, right? Because it's a very lonely road sometimes to be a solo entrepreneur type of thing, sure. right? Because 
I was sometimes out there freaking 11 p.m., 1 a.m., trying to do stuff, trying to wrap up stuff mm -hmm. without having that partner to, like, help me out once in a while, right? Yeah. Uh, my wife has has been there, but she she's more on the back burner. She helps me with like leasing, uh, sure. and I I take all the calls and stuff like that. Uh, and that was from the get go. That's what we had agreed to. But I wanted uh, to potentially just grow this into something bigger, right? Mm -hmm. Have bigger uh, bigger plans. And in order to be able to do that, you have to leverage other people's time, other people's knowledge. So I'm like, at this point, I think it's a good uh, it's a good time to actually partner up. Yeah. And I, I went through my uh, circle, you know, of people that I have around me yeah. that I'm like, OK, who has that time? Who has that motivation? Who has that knowledge or who is looking to acquire that knowledge uh, to to, you know, continue growing in the same aspect and the same goals that, that I was trying to. You were like you're talking about like the leveraging you were looking at. Well, how can I leverage my experience and my expertise i guess and your your assets your time your what you're doing and how you can use that collaborate with somebody else and leverage their time experience and knowledge network and everything man yeah. and that's how it came about i went through my through my circle and i'm like okay you know this person is in the same spot this person this person is not this person is in the same spot because i mean i left my nine to five or eight to five mm -hmm. on on december right this yeah. last december and it, it would have been tougher to actually partner up with somebody that was still in the in the eight to five because sure. I mean it, it's hard. Like okay, I'm I'm doing work from eight to five in regards to growing our stuff together, but right. you're you're doing something else, you know? Yeah, it doesn't line up, and right. It, and even then, like doing what you did with um, with Nice Casas, that's a very difficult feat in such a short amount of time, while still holding a full time job. Right. When did you decide to make that leap? Because, I mean, leaving a secure, nice little paycheck is not... Yeah. Talk about explaining something, you know, to your wife. And, uh, <laughs> how does that even the conversation come across? Or how did you decide that maybe this is the threshold? Or how did you pull the trigger? So with my wife, we went into a boxing match. Mm. Nah, I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're going to lose, bro. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm smarter than that, man. <laughs> No, no, no. With um, with my wife, we came to a point, you know, she graduated with a master's uh, yeah. about two years ago and she took a sabbatical. Uh, we were actually in, in Mazatlan for three months and we were working remotely. And uh, and she yeah, when when we came back from that, I was like, hey, you know what? I do want to leave this job eventually, you know. Mm -hmm. And she's like, you know what? Um, you picked up the slack while I was, <laughs> you know, chilling. Yeah. Um, I'll do the same, you know. Uh, and it wasn't completely like there's no money coming in. There is money coming in because of the rentals. Um, with Nice Casas, I built up a, a nice portfolio to be able to secure a uh, not not a paycheck where I was earning in, in regards to software engineering. Sure. But something in the middle i basically cut my salary in half but i was now owning my time mm -hmm. right and if before i was doing so much with so little time now that i have more time i'm like okay this is gonna let's just say control our type yeah. of thing right this is yeah. gonna explode <laughs> yeah so 100%. that that was the mentality behind it but i wanted to build that cushion that's what helped me and helped my wife uh come to the consensus of actually making it happen uh, so right now it's basically on the 15th of every day I deposit money into our account from the rentals and mm -hmm. off we go. That's awesome, man. Congratulations on that. That's that's a huge <laughs> feat to be able to go Thanks. in and really focus on your stuff. How Robert Kiyosaki talks about minding your own business, right. focusing on your stuff. And I mean, what better way to do it than dropping that eight to five and going ham on this, this, uh, this new feat that you have and you're already being successful at it. Thanks, um, over the last, how long have you been doing the three, four years? Uh, investing? Yeah. It's about to be four years, yeah. And so you partnered up with Amador just this spring, right? Yeah, this spring. That's yeah. great. Coming into this, you have that background in technology. You have that background in software. Have you used that or are you thinking of using it with the investments? We are using it. We are using You're it. You're using uh, it now? Yes. Yeah. Like today was actually the start of our sprint. In software mm -hmm. engineering terms, that's the start of a two-week period 
where you commit to doing specific amounts of work. Interesting. Yeah, right? that's awesome. And so, like, uh, at this point, we got together today yeah. uh, and we're like, okay, these are the things that need to happen within the next week, right? Yeah. And you bring them into the sprint. You grab that stuff, you throw it in there. Think of it like as a bucket, right? Mm -hmm. I need all of these tasks because you have 100 tasks. Sure. You have 200 tasks. You bring in the top tasks into the sprint and the you concentrate on that, yeah. right? Yeah, awesome. So within uh, within these two weeks, that's what me and him commit to doing. Yeah. After that, uh, in two weeks, we'll see what we didn't accomplish, mm -hmm. what we did accomplish. We'll talk about why things didn't get completed, why... Uh, um what we could have done better so like retrospect retrospective is a sure. it's kind of like a ceremony that they talk in software engineering where you talk about what we could have done better like a debrief yeah. right yeah that's exactly what it is and then we say okay there's the next two weeks what do we need to bring in it's kind of like that uh it came from toyota uh the guys at toyota like they developed this stuff because they were running behind on stuff so they needed to develop a system to get things done faster and quicker. So it came the agile methodology. So mm. Scrum. Uh, I, I used to be a Scrum master before. So yeah, that that's what we're using right now. Um, and of course, you know your Google uh, Suite, Google mm. like, Drive, Google Sheets, uh, Gmail, freaking everything, everything with technology that's helping us and uh, enabling us to continue moving. I mean, that's a huge asset to be able to have that conocimiento, that knowledge, you know, in your in your arsenal and be able to implement it into your day to day or in this case, weekly, you know, or a certain a certain period of time, kind of like slave mode, go in there and kick ass for that time. Mm -hmm. Really, really work and focus on those top echelon priorities, mm -hmm. make things happen that you might have not really focused on before, because right. that's so true. I mean, it, it really just rang a doorbell on my side. I was you know, when you just told me that, because <laughs> it's true. There's some times where you have to focus on certain things and really make it right in front of everybody's face. The whole team say, you know what, this is something that we need to do now and uh, have everybody's involvement, at least focus. in Because you, you do sometimes have to wear several hats, but the way you're explaining it, this is just a higher focus on these particular things. So, yeah. um, well, that's, you know, getting into that, the the investment side and being able to implement technology. I know that you were mentioning something about some software that you were creating or you do you were working on. Is that still something that you're doing or is it still in the process? It's on the back burner right now, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah I haven't done anything with software. Uh, I, I actually had like, I was part of two other LLCs where we were trying to do apps Yeah. and uh, we were going hardcore uh, on it, you remember, but yeah. uh, you know what? It, it didn't, it didn't gain any enough, enough traction. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have enough time, both of us uh, in, who are in the LLC, to actually, you know, make it happen. And then I got into real estate, mm -hmm. you know. So I'm Makes like, sense. okay, we'll push that to the back burner. We'll yeah. come back to it uh, eventually once I, you know, have that envelope or, you know, that yeah. mailbox income yeah. <laughs> coming in. Yeah, really vamp it up and that i mean mm -hmm. to me it was a, a really good idea but the priority you're talking about priorities right now you're seeing the priority and the you know you're chasing at it so yeah what is scrum master scrum master <laughs> you've said it a couple of times what is that it's it's basically kind of like you're working with the team right you're working with a team of software engineers testers preferably everybody's doing a little bit of everything right oh. so uh as a scrum master you're in charge of kind of like helping lead the meetings, kind of like your retrospectives, your debriefs, your planning, what's coming into the sprint, uh, prioritizing potentially some of the some of the work that's coming into the sprint. Yeah. Uh, talking, for example, when I was a Northern Grumman, there was a lot of conversations with government agencies, right? Government people coming in and they they have requirements, right? They freaking provide you with a 200 sure. page document of requirements. Yeah. And then you help the team break that down into bite-sized pieces so that you can start working on that right the minimum viable product type of thing yeah uh, get something out and then build on that so that you keep on making sure that you're building the right thing uh, as you're building it because every two weeks you're meeting with that uh, uh, product owner or you're meeting with the actual client to say hey this is what we're building do you want us to pivot so every every two weeks you have uh, the ability to pivot 
at some point. And with the other waterfall uh, scenarios, you're building this thing and I'll see you in a year and then I'll bring you what we built. Interesting. <laughs> I mean, uh, you're talking about this and it's tech, it's on the tech side. It's on the software side. But you're talking about a lot of the same structure items of business. Yeah. I mean, it's management. It's uh, task orientation. It's, uh, you know, development. It's, you know, making every making sure everybody's on task and performance and, and all that stuff that's really drives, it really drives business. Yeah. And without even knowing you were over here training how to do this. <laughs> or at least the basics, right? The fundamentals. Yeah, it has worked out. It's definitely worked out, man. Um, I want to hear from you. For anybody listening, I'm sure there's tons of people trying to get into real estate investments, right? <laughs> this is like the the new and, and, and happening thing that everybody wanted. I've been wanting to get into real estate. I'm going to need to connect with you again, <laughs> right? But th right? there's the two or three things that you would say that are the most crucial, the biggest things that you could say that would help somebody out trying to get into real estate investments. To me, uh, it was building that knowledge. And that basic knowledge, right? Yeah. Not, I, I'm not talking like become a guru in, in real estate. You, you you get that with time and yeah. with practice, right? Uh, I don't think I am there and I don't foresee that happening within the next two, three, four years, five years. Maybe it will happen eventually. But it's building that knowledge to actually be able to have conversations with people about it and you're not just lost, right? Yeah. When people talk about the Burr method, when people talk about an appraisal, a HELOC, an ARV, uh, all of those terms, you got to be able to have conversations sure. uh, to be able to uh, understand and uh, just be knowledgeable about it, right? So podcasts, you know, just podcasts, books related to real estate, I would say education was was kind of like the thing that enabled me to say, you know what, I'm ready. Yeah. And I guess the other thing would be kind of having somebody on the back of your mind that's willing to help you in regards to like, being that rubber duck that they call right mm -hmm. like just hey i thought about this or hey i ran into this deal these this is how my numbers look like and then that person can be like you know what it, it works out or you know it's what a second opinion yeah second opinion somebody mm -hmm. that you feel comfortable with yeah because it's all about numbers numbers are gonna either make it or break it yeah if if the numbers work out at the end then it works out it's a just move forward and put the work that you need to in order to make it happen but having that person to be like, you know what, it does, it, it you know, if it walks like a duck, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. it is a duck, go for it type of thing. It's a that, reassurance. That's what it is. It yeah. is. It is. And yeah. as, as a newbie, that's what you need. Yeah. So like uh, Amador, he, when he was looking to buy his house hack, yeah. he's like, hey, Jose, I ran into this deal. And he texted me like around you know 7 p.m and yeah. then he texted me around 9 p.m and 11 p.m and then the next morning and i'm like like are you sure are you sure are you sure he said this is what i'm thinking this is what i'm thinking and i'm like you know what it, it, it is what you're thinking you yeah. know and just go for it if you want to pull the trigger and you're serious about it and it does look like a deal then just go for it you know uh, there's there's uh sometimes there's there's enough wiggle room to make a couple of mistakes but it's all learning yeah, it definitely is. Failing, I think, is is part of that. Even if it does happen, and yeah. you've said it before, real estate is forgiving. So it is those failures. I mean, there's still a lot of room to fail forward. Yeah. So there's maybe little hiccups is more of what they are. So yeah, yeah. Most of the times. But <laughs> <laughs> um, well, with that being said, man, I want to dive into a little bit of here before we run out of time about success and 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 your definition of it. Um, what does success now in your position, where you're at now, what does success mean to you? You know what, uh, thinking back to those Palmitas days, you know, I was, uh, one of the Christmases, I, I remember my mom took me out to like the, the city in Culiacan mm -hmm. and we were driving around, not driving around because we didn't even have a car. We were mm -hmm. going in the buses, right? Yeah. Freaking people's armpit yeah. on your forehead type of thing, right? <laughs> Still happening to these days. Really close up and in <laughs> yeah. intimate, right? <laughs> close up and personal. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, you want to get off the bus and give that person your number because you're like, man, I, I, I know you know. <laughs> so um, we were going to the store and I remember this little like remote control car. It was 200 pesos. I, I like, I was probably like nine or eight when I saw this thing. Yeah. 200 pesos. And I knew she wanted to buy it for me, but she couldn't. 
So that Christmas, I opened up the present. It wasn't the little control remote car. You know, it, it would have been badass, but mm. it wasn't. <laughs> it was another nice present that she, you know, was able to give me. But, you know, as a, as a kid, it's really hard to understand some of that stuff, right? Because you want, uh, you want what you want. And sometimes it's really hard as a kid to see the struggle of those around you who are actually helping raise you. Right. And to me, success at this point is being able to provide to the future generations um, basically the ability to find something that they're passionate about and go after it without having to sacrifice their time working on an eight to five, right? Yeah. So having that ability to have that uh, that money there available for them you know for yeah. for me to find something that i'm passionate about for my wife to find something that she's passionate about and go out after what you're passionate about without having to compromise in regards to like okay because time time flies right time flies and time is the only thing we have and life is only one right yeah so being able to provide that for people to go after what they're passionate from the get-go i'm saving people hundreds of hours of time right. i'm saving my family my kids i'm saving hopefully people around me you know a lot of time for them to invest on something that they love yeah and that's what i want to do right now too like i'm building we're building something for us to be able to to do what we love to do the things that we like to go to those uh ferias in mexico yeah. you know when when we want to because uh even in the ferias like we would go to the ferias and we'd only have right and money for like two, three rights, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's being able to go to those uh, occasions, go visit family whenever I want, go having been owning my own time. And yeah. It's all about that. I think success is just owning your own time and being able to do what you love. That's great, man. You mentioned a little bit about, you know, within that definition that you just gave, a little bit about what a lot of people would define as a legacy is leaving a little bit of a mark. Does What does legacy mean to you? Is that something that you consider as a part of your responsibility to do? Or is, are you more worried about just being a provider and being something sub, of substance for yourself and the people around you? I, I wanna like even uh, like, it goes back to, uh, to what I kind of mentioned in regards to like letting people do something that they love, right? And mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily have to be like, my family of course my family first sure. right but i also want uh, other people like i know a lot of people in mexico yeah. from the smaller towns have to go to like culiacan to study right yeah. and it's hard for them to find a place to stay in, in culiacan they can't afford it or they have to work you know crazy hours to be able to yeah. go to school you know so uh, helping people accomplish what it is that they want you yeah. know and using that as a legacy it's not necessarily like the money that's going to be the the legacy or the houses that are going to be the legacy the legacy is going to be those people that are able to leverage that to accomplish their goals that's you know? a very humble and you know, selfless goal man I, I i love it thank you but but i also want to travel i also I want to do my own thing i also want to party <laughs> i'm gonna say you you've gone to several places i think uh, italy and where, where else i mean you were sure. out about in europe i think this year right yeah we've been to italy greece uh spain netherlands great britain morocco uh puerto rico uh, yeah it's mexico of course, yeah. mexico several of course times. yeah several times so that's that's the dream and you're getting after it you're making things happen you're collaborating and you're traveling kudos to you man thank you well with that from it. what i'm getting one of the biggest things that i'm getting from this whole conversation is leveraging time leveraging assets leveraging resources leveraging friendships leveraging people leveraging everything that you can leveraging money leveraging right. those is about connecting with the right people doing your due diligence putting in hard work mm -hmm. making sure your focus is in the right direction and really just making it happen i mean there's not a lot to it just get after it yeah sometimes a train comes to the station only once and if you don't get in it, it oh leaves. i love that you know yeah. <laughs> light bulbs lighting up the yeah. light, light switches <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right man well last question i always leave off with this and i want to ask you the same if you could tell your 21 year old self ooh, 21 year old self one thing today what would that one thing be start drinking now no, I'm no. Playing. I'm playing. <laughs> as a 21 year old that's what the first thing that comes to mind 
No, I would say just uh, be willing to keep your options open, like podcasts, you know, uh, if there, if you have different ideas in mind of what you want to do or something interests you, find a podcast related to that. If it's not it, move on to the next thing. You know, if, if for example, like drop shipping, I, I started looking into that. I'm like, I, I downloaded a book and I'm like, you know what? It's not for me right now, maybe in the future. So I get, uh, I move on to the next thought. Yeah. I move on to the next thought. And eventually you'll find something that you're passionate about. And that's what really drives people. Once you find something that you're passionate about, it, hard work becomes easy work. I'm guessing at 21, you did not know exactly what you wanted to do. No, at 21, I, I, I can't, I don't think it's uh, appropriate to talk about oh God. <laughs> what I want to <laughs> do. No, I, I, I had goals to graduate and stuff like that. But sure. um, I mean, I, I, I would have wanted to start investing earlier. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me at the Xarvin Insurance Podcast. Jose Peña, owner and founder of Light Switch Homes, Nice Casas, LLC, and Bill Tour, LLC. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.